My name is Deepa Govindarajan Driver. I'm a trade unionist and academic, and um, I've been interested in supporting Julian Assange as a citizen activist because I believe that what WikiLeaks does in terms of enabling whistleblowers, what Julian has done in terms of mobilizing evidence in order to reveal the crimes of the powerful and the crimes of the state are very important, and that it is horrendous that he is being tortured and um, mistreated in this manner. So, um, as some of you may be aware, <clears throat> in WikiLeaks is this, it's like a massive drop box, but it is the first time people on the ground, especially, you know, soldiers and people who are uh, analysts, could upload data which revealed evidence of war crimes. And this was in the form of things like the Iraq war log, uh, the Afghan war diaries, the Iraq war logs, um, stuff that Chelsea Manning revealed, information about corruption in Africa, for example, information about climate change related issues in other parts of the world. So WikiLeaks, for a long time, you know, even in Iraq, for example, people were aware that these crimes were taking place. So the journalists on the ground were aware. But what they didn't have is the hard evidence that they needed in a secure way that they could transmit to the rest of the world. And when Julian did this, he enabled us to have something called unfiltered evidence, that is, which did not have the opinions and the slants of the journalists who could themselves be intimidated. So doing this put out information that was hugely, hugely important in holding the US and the British governments to account for the kinds of war crimes they are committing abroad in our name. And it is because of this that the American government and um, there are these things called the Stratfor leaks, where they talk about how they are going to destroy Julian and how they're going to destroy WikiLeaks. And they talk about, you know, taking, smearing him, taking him into custody, making sure, moving him from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, affecting his family. And all these things are part of a planned strategy, which we've known about since for the last eight, ten years, um, which tell us that the American government does not want for people to know that what Ameri when America goes in saying, I'm going to help this particular country or I'm going to rid you of a dictator, actually what they're after is their own geopolitical interests. And as a result of what Julian did and the kinds of information that WikiLeaks revealed, many of us became much more confident, much more satisfied in our position that what was happening in Iraq, Afghanistan, in other parts of the world was wrong. And when you look at the wars in Libya, in Syria, in other places, you recognize that unless there is information from the ground as to what's really happening, without people masking that information, manipulating that information, saying things like, oh, but we must be, we must protect our informants when actually some of these informants are actually people who are killing others, torturing others, maiming others, maiming children, maiming women. This becomes very important. So that's why um, the American and British states have a vested interest in attacking WikiLeaks and attacking Julian Assange. Uh, so are there well, we know that the NSA the FBI and the CIA have worked very closely in attacking and um, affecting Julian Assange and attacking WikiLeaks. We're also aware that here in Britain, you would be amazed, you know, we've about 4% of uh, rape crimes, sexual assault crimes get taken to court and get given the kind of um, serious treatment they deserve. Yet when Julian Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy, it is quite interesting that the Metropolitan Police has put it on the record as a result of um, questioning that over two million pounds was spent at a time when people are homeless, people are dying on the streets, children are not having basic meals at home or at school. Two million pounds was spent in surveilling the embassy alongside what the CIA and others have done in spying on Julian Assange inside the embassy. This is an embassy of a sovereign state. 
And they were spied upon conversations between Julian and his lawyers, which are known as privileged conversations, as any defendant would have the right to privacy in terms of talking to their lawyers. They were spied upon. There were, you know, devices, bugs fitted even in the ladies' toilet so that there could be no assumption of privacy. So the amount of money that had been spent, and, you know, these things don't happen without the intelligence agencies actually being involved. They, it's not you or me that goes around is deciding, okay, today we're going to bug Julian Assange and it's easy to do. These are very clever actors, very capable actors, people with access to both information and tools to be able to attack somebody else. And there's a wonderful um, couple of articles that I'm happy to share with your viewers written by um, Lisa Johnson. Um, she's an Australian psychologist who studies the um, the ways in which um, psychological torture and other forms of torture are used. And she's explained what they do in Guantanamo, what they do in other parts of the world. And it is quite interesting to see how professional skills, whether of the CIA, whether of psychologists and other people, are being harnessed in order to destroy and defeat anybody who tells the truth about what's really going on in the world. Sure. Um, as you can imagine, psychological torture is is a very dangerous thing. It affects your physiological system. In addition to this, having been out of the sunlight, whether in the Ecuadorian embassy or right now in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, Julian has experienced a lot of physical difficulties. These include a chronic lung condition, which um, has been there since 2012. Um, he has had four infections to his lungs. And as anybody who's had pneumonia will tell you, once you're affected, there is a greater likelihood of being affected again. There are also issues with early onset osteoporosis because of lack of sunlight. He is now in Belmarsh prison where there is a COVID outbreak. Professor Richard Coker of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has written two reports, one in support of Julian's bail application, one for the Howard League for Penal Reform. And in that, he explains how it's like a little pressure chamber where as soon as one or two people get it, a lot of people get it. We know for a fact that at least one person has already died in Belmarsh. And Julian is there where he's a vulnerable prisoner. He's 23 and a half hours a day in his cell. And for those of us who are struggling with coronavirus, you know, self-isolation, can you imagine what it's like to be stuck alone by yourself? You're a highly intelligent individual, you're ill, and you're stuck in a small cell for 23 and a half hours a day. And when you're taken out of that cell for half an hour, you don't really get to, you're, you're in a place where you could potentially be exposed to COVID because as we know, prison guards are going in and out of the prison um, in some of the prisons, we are aware that they're doing this thing called cohorting, which means that, and this is, I think, Little Hay was the one which was mentioned in some of the press reports. Essentially, when you're in prison, people who are in prison talk about this thing called a prison smell and a prisoner's cough. We're in old Victorian buildings. Your air passages dry out, your nasal passages dry out, and your throat dries out. And many prisoners in prisons have a cough. In what they do with cohorting is put anyone with a cough with anyone with COVID and put them together, which means that you're now, you know, hugely affected. And we have to be very, very careful in these circumstances because, you know, Julian's not the only one affected. There are a lot of vulnerable prisoners in there and we recognize that. But here is a publisher and a journalist who has not committed any crimes. He's a remand prisoner, which means that he is as yet unconvicted. He is vulnerable because he has a lung infection and COVID affects the lungs. And he has a weakened immune system because of 10 years of psychological torture. So there is no reason why the British government shouldn't release him. There is no good reason. And yet they say they won't release him because as yet he's an unconvicted prisoner. This is sentencing somebody to death because that's what COVID can do to somebody who's vulnerable and then pretending as though you're following due process. This is complying with the letter of the law and pretending as though you're doing justice when you come to the court. Well, actually, you're undermining the spirit of the law. In terms of being proven guilty, what 
he is a peaceful man. He, clearly, he, he, he has a deep commitment to peace if he is seeking to reveal war crimes. He's the Hillary Clintons, the Obamas, the Tony Blairs of this world are roaming free while the person who reveals the war crimes is put in prison. Aren't we ashamed of this? And what is the Labour Party doing about it? You know, we've fortunately we've had John McDonnell and Richard Bergen come out in support of Julian more recently. But why isn't why aren't questions being asked in Parliament? Why isn't a cross party parliamentary group being set up to to kind of ask what what is going on in this country that journalists can be put in prison? You know, if, for example, um, Julian was an American um, in fact, he's an Australian citizen, right? But let's assume somebody like Julian, who's an American citizen, reports on crimes in North Korea where they're starving people to death. And let's say North Korea has an extradition agreement with the UK. Do you think we would want those journalists from America to be extradited to North Korea? No, we wouldn't. We would consider that absolute sham that any, you know, any person reporting about US war crimes around the world, any journalist, could be subject to this. So this is absolutely atrocious that the, that the British state is involved in it. Julian, because he's served his sentence for, they say skipping bail, I say seeking asylum, because that's what he did. You know, he was aware, he offered to go to Sweden to be questioned as long as he was not rendited to the US. He offered for them to question him in the UK and they refused both on the insistence of Paul Close at the CPS. By, we have freedom of information documents over 700 pages revealed by Stefania Maurizi, an Italian journalist, who has revealed both in Sweden and in the UK that there was collusion between the CPS and Sweden to keep the case in limbo at a preliminary investigation stage where no charges were ever raised and he was never able to clear his name. So, so we have this person who has never been charged for anything, potentially likely to be rendered to the US via Sweden, which has previously rendered two asylum seekers just before Julian to the US, <laughs> right? And we have this case where now he, he was put in prison for a term of 50 weeks for a minor offense, which is skipping bail because your life is in danger and you're seeking asylum. He's completed that sentence. They, you know, he, um, they release you at half time for good behavior if, as long as there are no breaches of bail. He was in Belmarsh for 25 weeks. And then last September, or oh, thereabouts, um, maybe slightly later, he finished his sentence. And then we have the situation where he's now in Belmarsh prison, in isolation, in maximum security, waiting for an extradition trial to happen. The first phase of that extradition trial took place in February. We had four days of trial. I would encourage everybody to read former British ambassador Craig Murray's Our Man in Court. Craig shows us what a mockery of the judicial process it was. Thereafter, particularly in the light of, um, so there are two phases to this trial. The next phase is in May, particularly in the light of COVID last week on the 25th of March. There was a bail application hearing where it was asked if um, the the lawyers made the points that Julian is a vulnerable prisoner. He is not able to meet his lawyers. They have over 40,000 pages of documentation. And he needs to review them in some depth with his lawyers. It is an important part of the case where they cannot accept his instructions. The video link room requires you to go through a shared area, which Julian obviously and others, anybody who's vulnerable would be affected if they used the shared area. <laughs> So that he can't communicate with his, and there, are, there is extreme short staffing because prison guards are awful. So the video link facility is not working. He's not able to meet his lawyers. He's, they're not even able to send him stuff in the post because it's sometimes going missing and sometimes not being returned. So they said, well, these are all reasons why there is no equality of arms between them and the and the American state, which has had a sealed indictment sitting in Virginia for a while. So they asked for a fair trial. Julian was not even able to participate. And the judge says, oh, the courts are going on as normal. We will have trial in May. You have not reached the threshold to put him, you know, to 
do anything else. So the bail application was rejected on the grounds that he was a flight risk. And the decision, discussion, the decision to the request to vacate the hearing in May and to move it to later in the year, say October, was also rejected on the grounds that everything was progressing as normal. I mean, that's completely bizarre given what we know is happening. We know that the mainstream media doesn't cover this case. And obviously they will be celebrating that neither the public nor some of the critical journalists like John Pilger and Craig, Craig Murray can actually attend. Some of the witnesses, many of the witnesses are overseas witnesses, particularly in relation to the spying on Julian, etc. And none of them can attend. None of the, you know, witnesses from the various journalistic organizations that WikiLeaks collaborated with can attend. And they will be giving evidence. So despite all this, the request to move the hearing was denied. In fact, in this pretense of giving Julian a fair hearing, the judge actually said she would convene uh, a an, what is called an ineffective hearing in Belmarsh on the 22nd of April, which means the court will sit, the lawyers will just make themselves present, but there will be no discussion. And in effect, it is used to allow Julian to come into the cells underneath the court so that his lawyers can talk to him once in these however many weeks we've been shut down due to COVID. So can you, I mean, is, is that a fair way to conduct a trial? Absolutely not. And a trial where this man is potentially likely to have 175 years in an American prison, he will be tried in the US under US laws without First Amendment protections. That means he has no, no rights to freedom of speech. And he will be tried for a crime which is not a crime in the states in which the actions took place. And it's it's just, and what is worst about this is if he does make it to the US, which we don't know if he will because he is so against going to the US. If he does make it to the US, then he will be under what they call special administrative measures of SAMS, which means that neither his lawyers nor he will be able to talk to the public or to, the, to other journalists, which means he will go into this black hole, which is what he's terrified about, of course, and which is what they used to torment him. Well, um, the human rights organizations in the past have been shamefully quiet because they were all terrified of these spurious allegations, you know, in terms of the misrepresentation of a very important crime, which is rape by the media. So they've all been quite quiet. But lately, Clive Stafford, Stafford Smith of Reprieve was on a panel where he condemned Julian's prosecution uh, and his ex potential extradition. Um, amnesty's come out a little bit. Liberty and others have been silent. So the other human rights organizations have been silent. The NUJ has put out a good motion finally in support of Julian Assange. I, I would encourage other trade unionists through their branches to put through, we can send you model motions if you like, to put out motions of support. Same with your CLPs. Um, we would encourage you to pass a motion in defense of Julian Assange. At a time when Keir Starmer is sitting as the head of the Labour Party, this is an important statement to make for the left. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, because nobody is above the law. If he is extradited to the US, he faces a um, trial in a court in West Virginia where um, the, the state has always won, never has a defendant won. And he faces 175 years in prison. He faces these special administrative measures, which mean that he cannot talk to the public or neither can his lawyers. And, and he will be, you know, treated brutally in the American system. This is, it's a heinous crime and we shouldn't be allowing this. We don't allow, we don't, kick people out of this country to be tortured elsewhere. We have to take a stand against this. Well, political action actions are, typic are outside the purview of the US-UK extradition treaty in itself. But the prosecution are harking to the broader extradition law of, I believe, 1923 to say that uh, Julian's case is not necessarily covered by the extradition treaty between the US and the UK which they will use to take him there, but they will not use for fighting their case. It's bizarre. I mean, the legal shenanigans that are being used to um, to not call this a political offence and to extradite him are horrendous. 
if you are a campaigner campaigning for, say, climate justice in Borneo and you find out that the U.S. government has committed a crime and you reveal that to a journalist and that journalist then publishes it and it's it reveals collusion between, say, American um, security services and the business interests, essentially you're, you are likely to be as exposed as Julian is now, your journalists and you. If you are a campaigner campaigning against any of the uh, breaches of civil rights in any of the jurisdictions, again, this suggests that anybody who reveals evidence of crimes of the powerful can potentially be extradited by a state which has, you know, the death penalty or its equivalent, 175 years in prison is a death penalty, to be to be fair. And it could, could shut you down. And so campaigners everywhere haven't realized, firstly, how important whistleblowers are. And how important the enabling of whistleblowers is because, you know, we're having this NHS problem with coronavirus at the moment. And a lot of people don't have PPE. Pe- people are being shut down by their managers and being told not to um, not to disclose the extent of not having PPE, etc. This is the time when we need whistleblowers the most, when we have a, an extreme right wing government here in Britain, extreme right wing government in America, in Brazil, in other parts of the world. And this is the time when normal political channels to surface information is not easily available. So we have to have whistleblowers. And if this is what we do to whistleblowers like Chelsea Manning and their enablers like Julian Assange, and we do if the British state and the American state shut them down, this is sending a big message to journalists saying, do not cross us. Because otherwise, you will be where Julian Assange was. Your life will be destroyed. Your health will be taken away. Your family life will be taken away. Your privacy will be taken away. You will be smeared and called uh, a sexual predator, uh, a narcissist. These are the kinds of things that have been said about him. He's been told, oh, why don't you come out of the embassy and go to, the, go to Sweden and face your crimes? Hang on a second. If you knew you were going to be extradited from Sweden to the US and rendered there, would you go out? No, and you knew that, and yet you kept quiet about it. So this is a time when whistleblowers, activists everywhere should be concerned about how a journalist and a publisher, a multi-award winning journalist and publisher, is being affected in this way. I think there's a bit of scared, but there's also, there are three things in my opinion. One, there are people who are scared, who lack courage. Two, there are people who have who lack knowledge and this lack of knowledge is either because they lack curiosity which some do and they're willing to take any pap sent out as a press release and put it out again but and three there are this the reason they are unquestioning is because people are hugely under resourced in various newspapers and so there's very little energy to do the coverage of complex cases but three there is this thing which uh, my colleague Catherine Brown refers to as the weaponization of positive ideals towards negative ends. So when any of us, even on the left, hear about somebody who's a child abuser or a rapist, instinctively our reaction to it is to switch off and say, well, they may be treating him badly, but if I look away, then I don't have to deal with it because the guy is a child abuser and a, pro- and a rapist and whatever else, and, you know, whatever you want to say about somebody, you call him an anti-Semite or whatever else. And then the support quickly falls away because the people who would traditionally support him on the left are so worried about themselves being tarred by the brush that they don't speak up. And when they don't speak up, that's when our rights get taken away, because actually what the establishment is doing very well, and we know this in a large number of cases, is misusing smears and misusing our respect for women, our respect for other faiths, our respect for whatever else, to tarnish and destroy people. And in the case of Julian Assange, this is the the issue of rape. And as a survivor, I feel very upset by this because it is wrong. To, to misuse this heinous crime to destroy an individual. Hmm. Just to be clear. He has a sexual assault allegation, set of allegations sitting on their head for 10 years where they can't deny it because it's never brought to court because you're not charged. 
and the media misrepresents him in every single article there's a little bit of a smear included right so sweden dropped the case three times and the last time they dropped it was on Neil Smeltzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, sent the Swedish government and the British government, which is a rogue state and hasn't responded effectively, a document showing the 50 odd reasons why Sweden should not have pursued that case in the way it did, or should have at least taken it to its logical conclusions, because this kind of holding things in limbo doesn't do justice for the victims of crimes and doesn't do justice for those accused of the crime. We, you know, it's very important that we recognize that rape is a serious crime and it should not be weaponized to, to torture and malign someone else because the people who, who suffer these have, you know, de deserve justice. I was reading an interesting article uh, with his, by his father and he was saying that the most important thing for Julian is to have some family time now. He's lost 10 years of his life for a crime he did not commit. He's lost, you know, time with his children, young children, time with his father, who's very old now, and his mum, who are all both elderly, you know. But what I mean is they're getting on, and it is important for him to spend time with his siblings and his family. I would really like, as an academic, to see Julian as a lecturer or a professor, and I think somebody else said this as well, at one of the universities, because he's got this wonderful way of explaining things without making you feel stupid about it. So it it would be really nice to see him share that information and share that wisdom and help us to uh, revitalize our understanding of right and wrong, and through his own life experiences, help other victims of these crimes. Very practical things you can do. Number one, lobby your local MP and uh, work in your local um, constituency parties to pass motions in your, your local branches. Make, if you're a trade unionist, make sure your national executive committee passes a motion in support of Julian Assange. Secondly, at a time of COVID when we can't stand outside and protest outside Belmarsh or protest outside Westminster Magistrates Court. I am sure we that the whole House events. will welcome the news this people. morning a that the Metropolitan people. Police don't have arrested Julian Assange. And don't arrested for breach of bail after nearly seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy. He has also been arrested in relation to an extradition request from the United States authorities. This is now a legal matter before the courts. Mr Speaker, this goes to show that in the United Kingdom, no one is above the law. We ask you to keep abreast of the case. And tomorrow, for example, we're having a, an online event. Um, I don't know when this um, broadcast is going out, but we're having an online event where Craig Murray, Andrew Feinstein, who, is, who used to work alongside Nelson Mandela, uh, Peter Oborn, the, you know, the journalist, um, Christian Raffenson, uh, Stefania Maurizzi, the Italian journalist, um, and a lot of good people, Catherine Brown, um, are all speaking on a panel, um, talking about the issues. And it's, I think the, the most important thing people can do is recognized because once people recognize what's going on Julian Assange is they no will hero use their own he's hidden from the truth creativity for years and push. years and, and it is right that his future should be decided in the British judicial system um, what's happened today is a result uh, of you able, years of careful diplomacy the by the Foreign Office and I commend uh, particularly our ambassador in we Ecuador not and Alan Duncan and his team here in London for their work but it's also a very courageous decision by President Moreno in Ecuador are, to resolve um, the situation to that's been going on for nearly seven so years. I mean, it's not so them. much Julian Assange being held UK, hostage in the Ecuadorian embassy. It's actually Julian Assange holding Julian Assange the Ecuadorian embassy hostage in a situation that. that was absolutely intolerable um, for them. So this will now be decided properly, independently by the British legal system respected throughout the world for its independence and integrity. And that is the right outcome. If you have doctors in your family or medical professionals or psychologists or psychiatrists, Please encourage them to recognize their professional obligations. If you have prison workers in your family, encourage them to, to take a stance against the incarceration of prisoners in hugely inappropriate conditions with 
uh, you know, because this is happening not just to Julian, but to a lot of prisoners all over Britain. The prison service is being sold off bit by bit, and, you know, um, services are being sold off, and budgets are very tight. And, yes, that these things are important. And so, yeah. yes. I mean, it is interesting that even here, you know, things like that you mentioned, for example, cockroaches, rats, etc. It, it, it is the case in prisons here as well. So these are not, I mean, we have reduced ourselves to the American standards rather than, you know, we're all behaving like we're in the, in the third world where people don't have the resources, but we do have the resources to change. We just need to use them for the right things. So my Twitter handle is Deepa underscore driver, spelled D-E-E-P-A underscore driver. So you can follow me. I tweet a lot about Julian Assange. I also tweet about trade unions and about more left issues more generally. Um, the Don't Extradite Assange campaign has both a website and a Twitter handle. In addition, you have the WikiLeaks own. I would encourage people to follow John Pilger and Craig Murray online, as well as Jonathan Cook. And, of course, Chris Williamson, who is also a strong supporter of Julian and has, um, for a long time, taken a very principled stance on the issue.